JLL believes you should expect more from your office space. So ask yourself, is your office space working as hard as you are? Does it foster collaboration, fuel productivity, and help build culture? Is it designed with intent? Is it a place you want to be? Your office can be a powerful asset. So put your office to work with JLL and see a brighter way. Learn more at jll.com slash Spotify. This decision itself stamps same-sex couples and LGBTQ people with the badge of inferiority and tells them you are not fully part of the constitutional order. We want to rule here and we have a decision to reach and the Supreme Court is just bending over backwards to get there. It feels like they are turning Brown on its head, using Brown, which desegregated our country, to resegregate higher education. Hi, and welcome back to Amicus. This is Slate's podcast about the courts and the law and the Supreme Court. And I am Dahlia Lithwick. That's my beat at Slate. And this Friday, the high court issued its final decisions of the 2022 term. There's going to be a little housekeeping. Uh, Then the justices are free for the summer. It could not have come soon enough. These last few days have seen some highlights and lowlights, and on this show, we are going to focus attention on three of the final merits decisions of this term. Next week, we will bring you our annual breakfast table in which we round up some of the best experts we know and chew over some of the big themes of the whole year. But today, we want to talk specifically about affirmative action, which came down on Thursday, 303 Creative, and Loan Forgiveness, both of which came down on Friday. Because I think it's fair to say that those rumors of the demise of the 6-3 Supreme Court were probably very premature. Thursday was a landmark day in civil rights history when the Supreme Court found in a pair of cases by 6-2 and 6-3 margins that race-conscious admissions programs are unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment in both public and private schools. The two cases, one out of the University of North Carolina, the other out of Harvard, produced six opinions amounting to 237 pages that tell us an awful lot about how the court wants us to think about race. Later on in the show, we're going to check in with Michelle Turnage Young, senior counsel at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, where she litigates education cases. And later still, my partner in crime, Mark Joseph Stern, will stick around to wrap up some listener questions and some legal news from beyond One First Street. That conversation is for our very special Slate Plus listeners. Thank you so very much for your support. And if you'd like to join Slate Plus members, starry, storied ranks, go to slate.com slash amicus plus. But first, on Friday, the final decisions of the term came down, and they were both uh, huge in 303 Creative. In a 6-3 to opinion penned by Justice Neil Gorsuch, the Supreme Court sided with a Colorado web designer who claimed she has a First Amendment right to refuse to provide services for same-sex marriages despite her state's public accommodations law that forbids discrimination against gay people. The court held that, quote, the First Amendment prohibits Colorado from forcing a web designer to create expressive designs, speaking messages with which the designer disagrees, end quote. Now, we have talked about this case a whole lot, this term, not least because the web designer never built a wedding website and was not asked to do one, nor did she refuse service to anyone. The entire case was built on hypotheticals, uh, but that's where we are joining us. To talk about this is our own Mark Joseph Stern. Hi, Mark. Hi, Dahlia. This is another unsurprising decision and yet another uh, punch in the neck. Uh, This one penned by Justice Gorsuch, who I think we were told was to have inherited Justice Anthony Kennedy's special solicitude for um, LGBTQ couples and discrimination against them. Uh, That seems not to have been the case. I want to start by saying what happened to the Justice Gorsuch who wrote Bostock v. Clayton County, the Title VII case in 2020, that gave us, or some of us at least, reason to believe that there was a major ally in Neil Gorsuch. 
Yeah, so I think Justice Gorsuch has a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde quality. And um, we saw in Bostock that he was able to write rationally and in in some ways movingly about the importance and value of non-discrimination laws for gay and transgender people in employment. But I really think that from the moment that decision came down, today was inevitable because Justice Gorsuch while evidently passionate about textualism, even when it leads to uh, protection of LGBTQ people, is also deeply passionate about what he views as religious free freedom and free speech. And even though Friday's decision is framed as a free speech ruling, everyone understands that this is about religion, that this is about Laurie Smith, the website designer, who, as you said, would refuse if anyone ever asked her, to make a website for same-sex couples because she thinks that same-sex marriages are, in her words, false. And I think that Gorsuch felt proud of this decision, just as proud as he felt of Bostock. I think he felt he is dispensing justice fairly, that in one decision he followed the text where it led him, and in another he followed the First Amendment to the place where we must, as a society, live forever under the rule of this court. And it is a place where, as Justice Sotomayor points out in her deeply poignant dissent, same-sex couples can never feel certain that they will be treated equally in the marketplace, even if they live in the most protective states with the strongest civil rights laws. They can never be guaranteed that they won't be branded with the stigma of inferiority, because not only can businesses turn them away by reframing their business as expressive conduct, but they can actually put up a sign that says, we do not serve same-sex couples under Justice Gorsuch's majority opinion. So yeah, it's the same guy. These are two passions of his. And I'm sure if you asked him, he would say there is nothing contradictory about authoring both of these opinions. I don't want to spend too, too much time on it, Mark, because we have talked about it So much in recent months, including when the case was argued. But you have said over and over, uh, you just said it there in your answer, there was no actual injury here. Lori Smith did not refuse service here. There is no Charlie Craig and David Mullins the way we had in Masterpiece cake shop, you know, human beings to come forward and say, here's the other side. And I just want to flick for a minute at uh, New Republic reporting that Actually, the ADF that brought this suit also relied on a non-existent request for services to prove that she had been approached. It's a whole long story. We'll put it in the show notes. Does any of it matter that it seems as though throughout this litigation it wasn't seminal, but certainly her lawyers relied on a report that she'd received an email from a same-sex couple that was seeking service, and that was the basis for her certainty that she would be approached to provide uh, wedding services for same-sex couples. Does it matter or none of this matters? I, I mean, none of it matters because Neil Gorsuch will make up whatever facts he needs to to reach the decision he wants to reach. We learned this in last year's Coach Kennedy decision, the Bremerton case, and it is reaffirmed here. But, you know, uh, clearly something strange is going on. The New Republic piece is wonderful. Everyone should read it. What it found is that at some points in this litigation, but definitely not others, Alliance Defending Freedom, which represents Lori Smith, has claimed that someone filled out this kind of form on Lori Smith's website submitting an inquiry for possible design of a wedding invitation for what appeared to be a same-sex wedding with, in the future, maybe the possibility of stretching for a website. So it wasn't actually a request for a website, but it was like starting to sort of gesture in that direction. Um, And the New Republic called up the person who allegedly submitted that request, and it turns out his name is Stuart. He is straight. He is married to a woman, and he has absolutely no idea how he ended up as a little scrap of the record in this case. I won't speculate too much. I will say that right around this time, ADF was also trying to craft a case about wedding invitations. And so if you were to believe that ADF submitted this form under someone else's name, it would make perfect sense to foreground wedding invitations rather than a website. But leaving all of that aside, ADF did not rely on that in the Supreme Court. ADF said very clearly, 
We believe there is a risk of enforcement simply because Colorado has said it will enforce this law and proved that it will enforce this law in Masterpiece Cake Shop when it enforced it against Jack Phillips. Um, All of this just further proves how this is a fake case. Um, It begins and ends fake, but the damage that it will do in this country is incredibly real And it begins pretty much now. And I think one of the most important points that Justice Sotomayor makes is, you know, even if no business ever discriminated under this decision, which they will, but even if, this decision itself stamps same-sex couples and LGBTQ people with the badge of inferiority and tells them, you are not fully part of the constitutional order. You do not have the right to be protected by a state in a law enacted through the democratic process that preserves your equal dignity and equal access to the marketplace. That is a grievous injury, much more of an injury than Lori Smith ever suffered. And it is one that many of us will feel for years to come. Your piece on this is so good, Mark. And I just want to give you a chance to do a little primer on the gymnastics that the majority opinion goes through in order to afford for first time First Amendment protection to trammel, uh, as you say, public accommodations laws by doing a whole bunch of things, including (laughs) compelled speech doctrine for individuals smushed together onto commercial entities for the first time, um, conflating cases about commercial speech and private speech, turning existing speech doctrine on its head and all rooted in this idea that somehow Lori Smith is being forced to speak words that are anathema to her. So do you want to just do a quickie on how Gorsuch gets us there? Yeah, so Gorsuch makes a couple of moves here. So first he says, look, we're not talking about discrimination based on status. This website designer is not just discriminating against gay people. She would serve a lesbian who sent her an email. She's discriminating on the basis of message, the message that her work would send about these false marriages between same-sex couples if she were forced to make it. And then the next move is making that website, creating that message, takes this beyond the realm of normal commercial activity into what Gorsuch calls expressive conduct, which receives evidently robust First Amendment protection. Now, it's true that expressive conduct has historically received free speech protection, but in the context of private associations and private citizens, the Boy Scouts, the court held, had a right as a private association of individuals to exclude gay people because it wanted to send a message that homosexuality was bad and accepting gay people would interfere with that message. Whatever you think of that decision, it was completely different from what the court decided today, which is that a commercial enterprise created and set up to make money for its proprietor has an expressive conduct right somewhere in the First Amendment, if you squint, to discriminate against customers. And again, not based on their status, according to Justice Gorsuch, but simply the message you would send by serving them. And I mean, this takes us back to the the vortex of hypotheticals at oral arguments, right? And in Masterpiece Cake Shop, is the the Dairy Queen employee going to rebrand as an ice cream artist and say that pouring the soft serve to serve a transgender customer is expressing support for their gender identity. I mean, that's a ridiculous example, but there are many that aren't. Justice Sotomayor brings up one, a real life example of a funeral home that refused to hold a memorial service for someone because he was gay. Would that be protected under this decision? I think the answer is yes. She talks about birth announcements, family portraits, epitaphs, all of these other integral parts of life, milestones we use to celebrate life. Now, every time a same-sex couple wants to do that, to participate in this basic joy of a relationship and a life lived together, they will have to wonder, will I face constitutionally permissible discrimination that the Supreme Court says is uh, completely protected speech And uh, will our own dignity and equality be subverted so that this individual, this business, this commercial enterprise can say no to us, perhaps in front of our own children, perhaps to our own children? All of that, those moves that Gorsuch makes, none necessarily follows from the other. And again, I just I encourage everyone to read Justice Sotomayor's dissent to understand how radically this breaks from existing precedent. 
Mark, you've already hinted at this a couple of times, but I really want you to answer in the most fulsome way you can what the limiting principle is here, because I don't I don't see it. I don't see it. And, you know, we as we we all know, we talked at oral argument about, you know, the photographer who just thinks that, you know, interracial marriage is bad. So he w- comes to take photos at the school, but won't take photos of children who he deems to be from false marriages. As you said, religion is both everywhere and nowhere in this case. It's hard not to apply this logic to folks who want to deny service on the basis of race. That has nothing to do with religion. And and by the way, we had this problem in Masterpiece Cake Shop where there was no principled way to distinguish. So I guess you started by saying, and I want you to finish by explaining how this plays out on the ground when, and I, you know, I say this with the valence throughout this term, we've talked about vigilante justice and people who become a law unto themselves. But if everyone gets to decide what is expressive activity and also to decide what is false and then withhold service based on that, I'm not sure where this ends. I mean, the short answer is there is no limiting principle in Gorsuch's majority opinion. Um, he could have written that uh, same-sex couples are simply inferior and are not deserving of the same robust protections under civil rights law as other people on the basis of race or religion or whatever. But he doesn't say that. He he focuses on same-sex couples and LGBTQ people, yet his reasoning applies across the board to all kind of protected traits. So going back to Heart of Atlanta Motel, you know, the key civil rights case where the court said that there was no First Amendment right not to allow Black people to stay at your hotel. What if the racist who ran that motel had said, well, I feel that by allowing Black people to stay here, I am expressing support for their race. Or by allowing an interracial couple to stay on my property, I'm expressing support for their false marriage. Would this court say yes to that? I don't know the answer. Uh, Perhaps it's limiting this discussion to LGBTQ people because they remain a, a somewhat unpopular minority and the court feels it can get away with opening the door to more discrimination against them and trigger less backlash. But I, I think that you're absolutely right that, you know, the Muslim uh, who's turned away by some Islamophobic jerk at, I don't know, a gas station because selling him a Dr. Pepper is this expressive act of brotherhood that he refuses to participate in. You know, you, you can go down the line of all of these examples and compare them to the court's decision and ask yourself, wait, will any of these actually fail? Or is this just an an absolute license to discriminate if you can dress it up in the pretext of speech, perhaps with some underlying infusion of religion? And that is terrifying, and it leads us into truly uncharted waters. Mark, I can hear how angry and frustrated you are, and I just want to tell you... I feel you. And I'm sorry, this is, um, as Justice uh, uh, Sotomayor uh, points out so eloquently, this is just a shocking, shocking day in civil rights. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we will be talking debt forgiveness with Dalia Jimenez, director of the Student Loan Law Initiative at UC Irvine. This episode is brought to you by Gero Formulas. Say probiotics and you think of gut health, right? But did you know our vaginas could benefit from probiotics too? Gero Formulas Femdophilus has two strains native to a woman's body, one billion CFUs, and is clinically studied to help balance yeast. So if your vagina is feeling a bit out of whack, try Femdophilus. Shop Gero Formulas, J-A-R-R-O-W, women's probiotic at Amazon. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. JLL believes you should expect more from your office space. So ask yourself, is your office space working as hard as you are? Does it foster collaboration, fuel productivity, and help build culture? Is it designed with intent? Is it a place you want to be? Your office can be a powerful asset. So put your office to work with JLL and see a brighter way. Learn more at jll.com slash Spotify. So with the last opinions issued and some of the justices no doubt boarding other people's private planes to get away for the summer, we are almost done with Opinion Palooza for this year. 
But before we hang up our emergency podcasting kits for another term, we're going to have a very special virtual event for Slate Plus listeners to keep the conversation going. Join me and Mark Joseph Stern on Friday, July 7th at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. While we debrief on the ethics scandals, the justices, the cases that shocked and surprised us most, we'll also answer your questions about the court and the decisions that came down this term. Plus, members will receive more information via email about how to join that Zoom event. And if you are not yet a Slate Plus member, good news, we're having a sale. Join Slate Plus today for only $29 for your first year. You will get access to Zoom events like this, ad-free listening, unlimited reading on Slate, and all the bonus episodes and segments that come along with our podcasts. So join us. Head to slate.com slash amicus plus to sign up today and slate.com slash live for more event information. And now we're back for this, our Opinion Palooza Saturday edition of Amicus at the end of the Supreme Court term. I want to invite in our second guest to bat around the other big, big decision that came in Friday uh, to the pair of challenges to President Biden's student debt relief program that would have canceled more than $400 billion in student loan debt for millions of borrowers. And the high court batted one of the two cases back. It was the one that had a weaker case for standing. But then the chief justice took the second and resoundingly found that the administration and the education department had exceeded authority to, quote, waive or modify loan terms allowed for debt cancellation. Only Congress can do this kind of thing. There are a lot, a lot, a lot of people who are getting very depressing emails about their loan status. So joining Mark and myself right now is Dalia Jimenez. She is a professor of law and director of the Student Loan Law Initiative at UC Irvine School of Law. And she writes about and teaches about debt, bankruptcy, and consumer financial distress. And just for people who are listening, the profound weirdness of a Dahlia <laughs> talking to a Dahlia is not lost on either of us. <laughs> but welcome to the show, Dahlia. It is just a treat to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me. And I thought we could just start, and either one of you can take this, on this question of standing, because this was a case where the Supreme Court jumps in, ruling six to three against the Biden administration program. Um, how did they find standing for the states that brought suit here? How about if I start as a non-constitutional law expert with sort of my take on it? which is to say that I think they bend over backwards to find, uh, you know, a reason to reach the merits here. And I am worried about what will happen in the future. But basically this whole, you know, six states sue, and this is the case they, they you know, they rule on. And But really it's only Missouri that even credibly has standing here. And the, the um, Robert's opinion, you know, the idea is that Missouri has standing because Missouri created this entity, Mohila, which happens to have us one of the things it does is that it's a servicer of federal student loans and um, with the Department of Education. And so as a servicer, it takes a cut. It gets a fee for every loan it services. And when the department or the Biden administration cancels student loans, there will be less student loans for Mohila to service. And so they will have less money coming in. Mind you, this is an aside that it was nowhere, but Mohila's contract about all of this ended in December. It was unfortunately just renewed, but that was after the case was heard. So Mohila stands to lose $40 million or so, they say, a year in servicing fees. And Mohila, which is its own legal entity, which has its own capacity to sue and be sued, who cannot reach state money and the state cannot reach its funds for any reason. It's it's really as separate as you can imagine, but was created by the state in my non, you know, constitutional law hat. And like, it sounds like it's a child of the state. Like it's just, you know, it's an independent thing, but Mohila will be harmed. And the government did not dispute that. I think there was reason to dispute that, but they didn't. And so now we're here in the world in which Mohila is harmed. And that means that because it's a public instrumentality of the state, it is, without citation, Robert says, harm to Mohila in the performance of its public function is necessarily a direct injury to Missouri itself. And that to me is like, I just made a thing up and I'm not saying <laughs> like, where this comes from. And it is, you know, nonsensical. And they cite some some case, you know, the Arkansas case and, and some Amtrak cases 
which Justice Kagan, I think, pretty much destroys in terms of um, how they're not actually, uh, you know, supportive here. But that's what it is. I think to me, it just feels like I, they really wanted to reach the merits here. I, I just want to briefly read and reflect on a passage from Justice Kagan's Extraordinary Descent. All the liberals have been on fire this week. That's like the one silver lining, right? We've got a great, a great team there. If only they had two more votes. Justice Kagan says, where is Mohila? The answer is, as far from this suit as it can manage. Mohila could have brought this suit. It possesses the power under Missouri law to sue and be sued in its own name. But Mohila is not a party here, nor is it an amicus, nor is it even a rooting bystander. Mohila was not involved with the decision of the Missouri Attorney General's office to file this suit. And Mohila did not cooperate with the Attorney General's efforts. When the AG wanted documents relating to Mohila's loan servicing contract to aid him in putting forward the state's standing theory... He had to file formal Sunshine Law demands on the entity. Mohila had no interest in assisting voluntarily. So we have this body of law about when one plaintiff can assert standing on behalf of a third party, right? And a lot of the fight between Roberts and Kagan is whether the third party standing doctrine could or should apply here. But this is a new frontier of third party standing because it's not just that Missouri is suing on behalf of Mohila, but that Missouri is suing on behalf of a Mohila that doesn't want to be here, that doesn't want Missouri to be doing this, that has absolutely zero interest in participating in this suit, that is being dragged into it against its own interests as an independent legal entity from the state of Missouri. And I think uh, there's language in Kagan's opinion that I think is so important that it's easy to kind of glance past. But she says that by granting Mohila standing and deciding this question on the merits, the court exercises an authority it does not have. It violates the Constitution. And I think it's so critical that Justice Kagan is not just saying the court misinterprets the Constitution or abuses the Constitution. She is saying we, as a court, are breaking the law. We are violating the Constitution that binds us and limits our power. And that is so refreshing because so frequently the court in an exercise of judicial supremacy pretends as though it is the one, the one part of government that declares what the Constitution means. And so by definition, it cannot violate the Constitution because it's the one that tells the other branches when they're violating the Constitution. And Kagan just bulldozes that and says, absolutely not. We are one of three branches. We are meddling where we have no right to be. Our decision today is itself unconstitutional. That is kind of a new development in the justices' rhetoric, and I think a very welcome one. It, it's so interesting, Mark. I mean, we we, we can get back to this, but this smackdown that takes place between the Chief Justice and Elena Kagan, who I sort of think of as not just the best stylists in terms of writing, but the most high EQ people, like who really kind of know what the public discourse is about the court and who are very attuned to these legitimacy questions and overreach questions. The fact that the two of them on like deeply personal terms, and you can tell, I mean, your piece is about this, but Roberts takes umbrage at the tone of uh, Kagan's dissent. But it really feels like at one level, we're talking about third party standing (laughs) and the major questions doctrine, but we're really (laughs) talking about something else. And it's just this kind of like, very, very, it could be like the Wall Street Journal opinion page, like, we're just telling you our feelings about other stuff. (laughs) And it's coming out in this opinion. Um, Dahlia, I want to give you a chance just to to go to the merits for one more beat, because, you know, at, at least ostensibly, the issue turns on the authority to act under the HEROES Act and to waive or modify loan terms for debt cancellation. Can you just tell us what the sort of underlying statute is and what it was and how extraordinary it was to, you know, use these powers in this fashion and then just tell us what the chief justice determined. Sure. So the Heroes Act is enacted shortly after September 11. And the statute, which the the majority of the chief justice quotes, authorizes the secretary of education to, quote, waive or modify any statutory or regulatory provision applicable to student financial programs under Title IV of the Education Act, as the secretary 
deems necessary in connection to the, with a war or military operation, or in this case, national emergency, the COVID national emergency. And so that, I mean, I, I wanted to really say that, you know, explicitly quote the language because it is so broad, right? And it has so it, as much as they deem necessary. And then elsewhere in the act, there's a part where, you know, it says you're not Anything that contradicts this has to be explicitly contradicting this. So you're not to look elsewhere for things that might contradict this unless they specifically mention contradicting the act. The idea being that Congress realizes that, you know, things are going to happen and they don't move fast enough in order to protect, in this case, student loan borrowers from being in a financially worse off position as a result of a national emergency. And so the HEROES Act is the one that Secretary DeVos under the Trump administration uses to institute the payment pause, which is then blessed by one of the coronavirus uh, relief acts, uh, the CARES Act uh, that Congress passes. But it continues despite that act and uh, which receives a very small mention in the opinion that this was one of the things done during the act. Eventually, Roberts, you know, seems to really be hung up on is the fact that this is a very expensive uh, program that will cost 460 uh, or so, as estimated by the congressional um, uh, CBO, $460 billion in in costs. However, the other plan, the the, uh, payment pause plan, which is still in effect until September, that one will have cost $200 billion by the time we're done. So if we're talking, you know, this is all very massive and expensive and and obviously very consequential to the economy, what he's really saying is that the student loan system is very massive and expensive and consequential to the economy. And this is what the Secretary of Education has purview over. But the Roberts just takes issue with this waiver modification, you know, of any regulatory uh, provision. And as um, the Kagan uh, uh, dissent you know, really just masterfully takes down sort of piece by piece. He is piecemeal parsing through the statute and reading these words waiver modification in isolation and saying, well, this isn't quite a waiver. This isn't quite a modification. It doesn't really fit those things. It's just too large. And now I teach contract law and the way that they're reading, you know, and they seem to be misreading (laughs) what waiver modification is, is highly frustrating. But because, you know, they're, they're, to me, again, this unfortunately seems like, you know, we just have a result here that we want to reach. And the, the text is way too broad. They couldn't have meant that, even though it's, clearly meant, um, intended this act as a way for Congress to delegate authority in situations in which things are moving fast and things are important and have a large, uh, you know, effect on uh, large numbers of people. Can I just add a quote about this from Roberts that I think is so telling? He says, the secretary's plan has modified the cited provisions only in the same sense that the French Revolution modified the status of the French nobility. It has abolished them and supplanted them with a new regime entirely. So Roberts is like, you know, basically, you guys are trying to wheel out the guillotines, and we are the last defense of democracy here. Later on, he cites Nancy Pelosi, completely like beyond any relevant material from the record in this case, uh, as evidence that it's impossible for the Secretary of Education to forgive student loans. Just a, a quote from Pelosi in 2006. This is the same chief who refused to seriously consider Donald Trump's many statements about a Muslim ban when upholding the Muslim ban. But it turns out that you can just pluck this quote from a Pelosi press conference from 06 and hang your hat on that, in addition to all of the other garbage reasoning, frankly, that Dahlia just cited. This is the chief being pissed. This is the chief being mad at the Biden administration, really, I think, losing his temper, both at Biden and Kagan, and reminding everyone who's in charge of this country, and it's not the president. So so I want to give you both just one whack at the (laughs) the major questions doctrine, um, because that's the cherry on top here. And and I think I'm going to do that by way of a really fun listener question I got earlier today. Somebody wrote in to say, "Um, Dahlia, is the major questions doctrine just substantive due process for conservatives? By which I mean, is this a court created outside the text rubric for doing whatever the hell they want? And I I think in a sense, I I, I mean, I'm not laughing because actually I think substantive due process process is really a thing. But um, it's just feels so absolutely cynical to say, you know, hatched in a lab just a few years ago, this brand new baby doctrine, let's call it 
the major questions doctrine. And then let's just say that things that have high political salience to be determined by us, and I guess Fox News, are the things that can't be delegated. It's so insane. I guess that was my question. It had no question mark. Go. (laughs) (laughs) It is insane. I just, I I mean, I'll go with the numbers. So it is insane in general, in this case in particular, in that they seem to be saying, you know, this, we're striking this down because it has vast economic and political significance. Anything that is nationwide, right, is going to have, which is like all that Congress is ever doing, it's going to have vast economic and political significance. Like who determines and how do we know what vast is? 460 billion is apparently vast, but 200 billion is not. You know, at, at what point, where do we draw this line? It really does seem, uh, you know, as a, as a law professor who has to teach, you know, uh, new lawyers. This is just one more thing on top of the very depressing list of things, um, you know, that, that I have to um, get over, get through with them uh, to understanding like what it's like to be a lawyer these days. I'll, I'll just add that, Dahlia, you're right, of course, that this major questions doctrine is completely made up. That's how Kagan describes it. But um, there's an interesting history here. Uh, John Roberts sort of like fertilized and implanted this theory in King v. Burwell, the 2015 decision upholding tax credits under Obamacare in states that hadn't set up their own exchanges. And I think he knew the liberals were going to sign on to whatever he wrote in that decision because it would save Obamacare from a death spiral. And so he wrote the decision as a precursor to the major questions doctrine saying, oh, well, this involves vast political economic significance. So we, of course, have to be the ones to decide it and decide it in this specific bespoke way that leads to whatever outcome I say it leads to. And now here we are. And every single one of these decisions cites back to King v. Burwell and acts like the liberals are such hypocrites for contesting the legitimacy of this doctrine. And I think they, they've contested it so fiercely that in, in the student debt decision, Justice Amy Coney Barrett actually wrote a very feeble concurrence in my view, essentially rehashing her own law review article from 13 years ago, trying and failing to justify the major questions doctrine on on other grounds, saying that it simply requires courts to look at the context of a law and the text in context is just the only thing that major questions really requires. Obviously untrue as this case illustrates, the context of the law is that Congress wanted to grant sweeping powers to the secretary to relieve student debt in national emergencies. So her theory fails in this case. Um, But, you know, here we are now, fast forward from 2015 to 2023, this has become the get out of text free card that the court invokes in all of these cases. And Dahlia, I feel for you. How are you supposed to teach this to students? It's so clearly made up. They look at the law. They don't like the text. So they say it means something else because they don't like where it would lead to if they interpreted it by its plain terms. That's the opposite of textualism. And it is the ostensibly textual dualist court espousing it. Dahlia, first of all, I just have to parenthetically note, Mark and I are trapped in hotel rooms. He's somewhere in California. I'm in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, an auspicious place to hear about the end of affirmative action. Um, Dahlia is in a camper in a national forest. Listeners, if you hear birds chirping, to be sure, that is not like your mental health. That is that one of these three people is making very much better life choices than the others. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give you one opportunity because Mark just said it, and I want you to to really concretize this for us. What does this mean? What does this mean? Because if we are really talking about these huge numbers and these huge numbers of debts and people who are getting notes in their inboxes saying, sorry, can you just help us wrap our hands around the enormity of how this shakes out? So I'll start with the depressing part. The depressing part is that 43 million people that were eligible for cancellation and 19 million people who had already been submitted their applications uh, will not get this died in plan cancellation that um, they were expecting. And that will mean that their payments will restart right now as planned and, and almost uh, inexorably in September, beginning in September, October, they'll begin to get payments and interest will begin to accrue. And so we can expect that the 
25 or so million people who were in delinquency at some point in the year before the pandemic will probably go back to delinquency unless and until the Biden administration uses some other tool, which they have plenty of, to do something about that. And that's the sort of positive, you know, uh, slight positive spin to this or potential future is that there are other tools. Um, unfortunately, the HEROES Act was a very flexible tool, particularly not just, you know, in, for any um, upcoming pandemic or national emergency. And it does appear um, that it has been um, really, uh, you know, kind of destroyed here in terms of the ability of the secretary to do, um, you know, large scale cancellation or large scale uh, changes to to the student loan program. However, there are other, you know, the Higher Education Act and other uh, avenues that the, the Department of Education and the Biden administration can take. And I am hopeful that they will do that. I, I hope that it will be in, in larger scales, um, you know, not just sort of as they've already been doing in rewriting um, or clarifying rules in public service loan forgiveness and, um, you know, uh, close schools uh, and discharges and all these kind of things. They've already been doing that piecemeal. The idea here, though, was that we really needed this kind of large cancellation when we have a system that has been dormant for three years, meaning no one has received bills, and these 45 million people are suddenly going to start getting bills. Um, and the process of getting bills is not magical. It is these servicers that have to put them in action, and it is a mess. I mean, if you imagine all of those bills going out to people who haven't been in contact with their servicers for three years, so a lot of people are going to be in different places, unreachable, not planning, you know, to, to make these payments. So I, you know, I think the administration knows that no matter what, it will be a mess. One of the beauties of this cancellation program was that we were going to have 30 million people were going to be off the student debt rolls. And so we wouldn't need to send any bills to them, which was going to make the program far more administrable than it currently is. Um, and so I'm I'm hopeful that there will be other ways to get there, but it will, um, you know, this was a, a sort of elegant way, I think, and um, and one that would have been quick. And uh, so it's I'm not like completely depressed about the student loan sort of landscape. I am a little depressed about the future in terms of the uh, potential to use, you know, the HEROES Act in particular for other student loan things and the sort of, you know, just we want to rule here and we have a decision to reach and the Supreme Court is just bending over backwards to get there. That is, um, yeah, not as hopeful. Dahlia, you sort of hinted at this, but I just want to like make it explicit. Who was the first administration to freeze student loan repayments in an act that very quickly cost the government billions of dollars? Donald Trump with Betsy DeVos as Secretary of Education. What law did they use to justify this extremely expensive pause? The HEROES Act. So it turns out that when a Republican invokes the HEROES Act to do whatever it wants, that this major questions doctrine just remains in the ether. It's just vapors around us. But as soon as a Democratic president wants to do something that's extremely similar, it turns out major questions is a jump scare right into the foreground. And uh, the Biden administration has committed a grievous constitutional and, and legal overstep. I, I, the hypocrisy is just like beyond galling. Completely right, Mark. And actually, it's even worse than that, because the payment pause was highly regressive, benefiting people who had graduate, more graduate loans, um, people who could pay but just didn't have to pay, um, whereas the cancellation uh, is is a the Biden plan was completely progressive and likely to at least um, lessen the you know the black white wealth gap and uh, and that's the one that is struck down. Dalia Jimenez is a professor of law and director of the Student Loan Law Initiative at UC Irvine School of Law. She writes and teaches about debt, bankruptcy, and consumer financial distress. Mark Joseph Stern, my captain, my captain, has been getting me through the last few weeks with whatever vestiges of sanity remain to me. Thank you both so very, very much for being here. And thank you so much for your just insight and clarity on issues that I think we're going to take a long time to figure out what it is that just happened. So thank you. Thanks, Dahlia. Thank you, Dahlia. Time for a break, and when we come back, I'll be joined by Michelle Turnage-Young from the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund to talk about what Thursday's big, big affirmative action cases mean for future students and the future of this country. 
At FedEx Office, we know running a business is a marathon, but sometimes every task feels like a sprint. Design the product catalog, pick up the new boxes, print the business cards, notarize the lease, put out 20 more yard signs. It's a lot. Luckily for you, FedEx Office is here to help turn your ideas into reality. So you can stop running yourself in circles and start concentrating on the important things, like deciding what's for lunch. Visit your nearest location or office.fedex.com to get started. FedEx Office. All days are here again. The Bargain King is your best friend. With deals so good, you're gonna win. All days are here again. We're celebrating Ollie Days, where the cheap gets cheaper. At Ollie's, we're celebrating our once-a-year customer appreciation bargain bonanza, where everything in our store is 15% off. And we mean everything. Ollie Days absolutely ends Sunday, July 2nd. Ollie's! Good stuff, cheap! We turn now to affirmative action and the two cases that may forever change college admissions in this country. We did a quick pass on Thursday's emergency episode, but we really wanted to do a deep dive. And so we wanted to talk to Michelle Turnage-Young, senior counsel at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, that's the LDF, where she litigates education cases. Michelle represented 25 Harvard student and alumni organizations as amicus curiae in SFFA v. Harvard. She received her law degree from Harvard Law School, where she served as a student attorney with the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau and is editor of the Harvard Civil Rights, Civil Liberties Law Review. Michelle, uh, it has been a week, and I want to just start by thanking you for taking time to help us unpack. Thank you so much for having me. So can we just start with the formalism? Because I think a lot of people were confused about why there were two cases and why Justice Jackson was only in one of the two cases and why we had both constitutional and statutory claims. Can you just unpack the Harvard and UNC cases for us so that folks kind of know what it was Absolutely. that was on the so table? So I'll start with why there was one opinion, why there were two cases. When cert was granted in these cases, uh, they were consolidated. And then we had Justice Jackson, who was appointed to the court. And in light of her service on the Harvard Board of Overseers, she declared that she would recuse herself from the Harvard case. And the next thing we knew, we were getting an order stating that the cases would be deconsolidated for consideration. And they didn't give a reason, but we presume that that's so that Justice Jackson could be allowed to participate in the consideration of the UNC case. And now we we are getting an opinion that is, you know, kind of the two rolled into one with the footnote stating that Justice Jackson didn't take any part in the consideration of the UNC case. And we have UNC is a public school, we had like a state school, and Harvard is a private school. And this was an effort to sort of resolve it for all colleges except military schools, which we'll get to in a minute. But this resolves it across the board, right? So um, UNC, we're looking at it under the constitutional claims, and Harvard, we're looking under right. statutory so claims. The um, UNC case, which is Akin to other challenges to race conscious admissions that have come before the court, uh, UNC is a public school. It's known by many to be the oldest public university in the country. And so the lawsuit that Students for Fair Admissions brought against UNC was filed under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. So just like In previous cases where there were challenges to the race conscious admissions policies of public universities, um, that was brought under the Constitution. Now, Harvard, of course, is a private school. And so instead of filing suit against Harvard under the Equal Protection Clause, which requires state action, the lawsuit was filed challenging the race conscious admissions policy under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits racial discrimination on the part of federally funded institutions. And so Harvard, of course, receives federal funding, and so they can be sued in that way. I don't know if I would say that this case resolves the question for all universities writ large. I think theoretically speaking, there might be some university out there that is both private and does not receive federal funding. And of course, that question was not before the court. And I'll also note very quickly, that the question of whether race can be used in college admissions at schools that are remedying intentional discrimination is also not a question that was before the court. So that's another thing to keep in mind, just like the military carve-out that we saw in that footnote. 
I guess I just want to ask you, after oral arguments in the case, I think we were surely expecting this outcome. I'm not sure we were expecting the breadth and sweep and sort of confidence of the Chief Justice's majority opinion. And I think maybe the reason it was a little bit surprising, Michelle, is that he had modulated some of his views on race in the voting rights cases. Just in the weeks before, uh, we saw him, you know, a lifelong opponent of the Voting Rights Act, suddenly changing his mind. I'm trying to, and I know it's not your job to parse the inner workings of the Chief Justice's um, thoughts about race, but do you sort of have a, a useful frame to think about why he was was willing to sort of bolster the Voting Rights Act at the same time that he was willing to really cut into the heart of affirmative action as it's It seems like a patent inconsistency, right? It's difficult to understand. Um, what I will say is that Alan V. Milligan, the voting rights case, I mean, it was a quintessential case of vote dilution. It was so clear. Um, and perhaps... This is an instance where we're seeing a jurist who can recognize racism in its most egregious forms, but may have some difficulty wrapping his mind around the concept of something that looks more like prophylactic relief, if you will. So here, it seems like you have the justice, you know, essentially saying and repeating what other um, Supreme Court jurists have said that surely we can't remedy societal discrimination, you know, kind of throwing their hands up as though it's an act of futility. And so we did see some language in there quoting Justice Powell in the Bakke decision, you know, talking about how societal, remedying societal discrimination is not a compelling government interest that can justify the use of race in college admissions. And we saw some discussion about that from Justice Roberts in the majority opinion as well. Could you reflect for a minute on, I think, sort of in the clear light of having read the opinions a couple times, the real indignity is not just doing away with, you know, race conscious affirmative action, but this colorblindness theory that is propounded by the majority. It's certainly, you know, brought to its maximalist reach uh, under Clarence Thomas in his concurrence, but it's just these references to Justice Harlan dissenting in Plessy. It's references to Brown v. Board and the career of Thurgood Marshall, you know, as though this is in line with a long, storied, painful history of civil rights victories. And I think, I'm trying to think, I think Sherilyn Eiffel was the person who describes this as gaslighting. You know, it's one thing to do away with affirmative action. It's another to cast yourselves as, you know, sort of the natural progeny of Thurgood Marshall in so doing. And I know this is a bit of a party trick. We see it all the time, right? Associating yourself with Dr. King while uh, undermining his legacy. But it does feel sort of extra, extra, I don't know what the word is, Michelle, trolley. Ghastly works better than trolley. I I just am am trying to think about how that lands uh, at the Legal Defense Fund when you are hearing and, you know, you you see it in the dissents, this just furious, do not use Thurgood Marshall's name as part of this project. But I I just wanted you to have a minute to to sort of reflect on how that lands. jarring um, to see Brown, the Board of Education, and the legacy of Thurgood Marshall being weaponized in this way. Thurgood Marshall spent years working to fight de jure segregation and remedy the vestiges of de jure racial segregation. Brown v. Board of Education was the Supreme Court intervening and saying that we're not going to have de jure racial segregation in this country. We are not going to deny educational opportunities to Black people. We are not going to allow this situation that is relegating Black people to second-class citizenship. And we will employ race-conscious remedies to cure the vestiges of the jury segregation. And so for that to be the actual history of what happened, and then for this court to turn around and say, Actually, what Brown v. Board of Education and Thurgood Marshall stood for was the idea that you cannot do anything about societal racial discrimination. And what's more, you know, we're going to just blind ourselves to racial inequality. We're 
not going to allow for the consideration of race. It's jarring. It, it feels like they are turning Brown on its head, using Brown, which desegregated our country, to resegregate higher education. You know, we, we live in the world that Justice Powell created. We can't talk about remediating past harms. We have to talk about sort of the benefits of diversity and, and the ways in which the chief justice, in his opinion, essentially says, well, that's not measurable. We've got no no data. And so it feels like it's a, a perfect loop of logic, which is th- this is the only ground on which we can fight. We can demonstrably show that we need this and that it works. And by the way, you've conceded it works for the military. And yet y- you just can't show us. So no, no good outcomes. So we move on. And there's just this strange way in which one wishes we could fight this on the terms that Justice Marshall would have fought it on which is actually, no, we don't have to talk about, you know, necessarily just the benefits of diversity. But as you just said, and as Justice Jackson lays out in her dissent, there is, you know, decades and decades and decades of abuses to be remediated, whether it's redlining or Jim Crow or the GI Bill. So please, please, please don't tell us this is something that is not measurable. It's all perfectly measurable. Absolutely. Um, That, too, is incoherent. So stepping back a little bit, while everyone recognizes that Baki discarded the interest in remedying societal discrimination as a rationale that could justify the use of race in college admissions, the rationale that was adopted, the pursuit of the educational benefits of diversity, kind of necessarily carried with it a need to account for racial discrimination. So let me explain just really briefly. If you are going to put universities in a position of reaping the educational benefits of diversity, they need to be in the position to be able to assemble a talented student body that contains people from all walks of life. How can you do that if you are living in an environment of systemic any unequal access to educational opportunities. How do you identify talent in that situation without, you know, paying some attention to the fact that educational opportunities in this country are unequally distributed and the unequal distribution has some correlation to race? So, you know, it really boils down to this. Talent is everywhere. Opportunity is not. And if the universities want to assemble a student body that contains people from all walks of life so that they can reap the educational benefits of diversity, they need to be able to take all of that into account. And so those things were always related in that way. And so I hear you when you're saying this is incoherent. You're speaking to this waving of hands by the chief justice saying this is not measurable. We don't know how to account for this. And therefore, it's just invisible to us. And yet it's perfectly visible to you, Michelle. How, you know, it's almost like a blind spot. And, you know, I want to say somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 briefs were filed in support of race conscious admissions. You had briefs filed on behalf of military leaders, on behalf of leaders in government, on behalf of the American Association of Medical Schools, various Catholic universities, colleges, um, 82 different corporations and business entities, social scientists, astrophysicists, like you name it. And these authors of Amicus Briefs were essentially saying the educational benefits of diversity are crucial. They are a national security imperative. They are a business imperative. They're a technological imperative. They matter to the health of our nation. And, you know, especially the American Academy of Medical Colleges, I mean, really making clear that it's a life, it's, it's a matter of life and death. And so much was said, you know, about the empirical evidence and all the ways that it is tangible and measurable. And so it really is just baffling that we end up getting this opinion that says, oh, well, you know, the educational benefits of diversity, that's really nice. It's nice that you're trying to equip your graduates to function in a multiracial democracy, but we can't measure that. And 
it just, it, I, I don't understand it. You know, the Solicitor General at oral argument made some very concrete suggestions about how the court might um, kind of create a standard that could be very tangibly measurable. If I'm recalling correctly, she suggested looking at graduation rates. Are there racial disparities in graduation rates and other factors that are very directly measurable? So it, it is a bit baffling that this is part of the rationale for why the court said that the admissions programs at Harvard and UNC were not narrowly tailored enough to pass constitutional muster. Michelle, there's been a ton of talk. I feel like I'm getting a mailing from every college in the country saying there's lots of loopholes. We've talked about one, the military loophole. There's the (laughs) may or may not be able to sneak it into your college essay loophole, depending on which part of the Roberts opinion you read. Yeah, I don't know if that's a loophole. Here at LDF, I have the honor of representing 25 Harvard student alumni organizations comprised of more than 18,000 Asian American, Black, Latinx, Native American, and white students and alumni. And one of the things that our clients have cared about so much over the past, you know, five plus years that we've been representing them is the ability to tell their truths in their college applications, right? Like they did not want to approach the college education feeling like they had to censor some portion of their experience because it might tip people off to their race. Now, just like rewinding a little bit, Students for Fair Admissions asked for certain relief in their complaint. And one of the things that they asked for was that the admissions officers be barred from knowing the race of an applicant. And our clients were fairly alarmed about that possibility, right? What does that actually mean? That means that you cannot do an interview in person because somebody might see you and they might see, you know, something about your heritage. You can't do a dance audition. You can't do athletic interviews. You might not be able to share your last name. You might not be able to share that you are bilingual. You might not be able to share your zip code because housing segregation, your high school. You might not be able to share, you know, our Native American clients pointed out like, you know, what if you're writing your admissions essay about what it was like to be a res kid? You can't share that. If you volunteered at the immigrant center that helped your parents when they were refugees from Vietnam, can you share that? No, you can't share that. If your volunteer experience was as a leader in the Black Student Union for four years, now you can't share your leadership experience. So it is significant that we did get that little tidbit in the, in the majority opinion that says that students can continue to share and colleges can continue to consider um, what applicants are sharing about how race inter, you know, is intertwined with their experience and how it's impacted their experience. And that may reveal something about the applicant's character. It might reveal that they um, are brave, courageous, have fortitude, and can contribute to the university in unique ways. And that can, can still be considered. So that was really significant for us. And we don't think of it as an end run about around the court's decision. We think of it as this is the majority acknowledging that that is not affirmative action. That's not some race conscious remedy. That's just allowing our clients to share their truth and who they are. I'm reflecting as you're speaking about the sort of triple-decker erasure here. You have these students who feel like their story is not, you know, told. Then you have, you know, the the voluminous trial record in both cases that is ignored by the case, right? So there's erasure, there's erasure. And then you have the Supreme Court, just as you said, blinkering, blinding itself to all of the, not just the evidence of why this is necessary, but the harms that will flow from it. And it's just level after level after level of turning away from what is right in front of you. It's just so painful to hear that that's the project here. So so I, I'm I'm hearing you say that every single college can and should send out guidance that says, make sure your essay says who you are. And if Ed Bloom and his friends come after us again, we'll litigate that. But this is not a loophole. This is absolutely in the four corners of the opinion that you get to say what your story is. That's what that's what I'm hearing you say. Absolutely. We want 
everyone who was previously thinking of applying to college to apply. You know, we can't afford as a country to forego the talents of anyone. And so it's really incumbent upon everyone to continue to apply to college, to tell your truth, whatever that is. You should not feel that you have to censor yourself because you are a student whose experiences are inextricably intertwined with race. That is so important. And I hear you when you say that it was painful to kind of see an opinion that seems to overlook so much of the evidence that we presented, right? We put students and alumni on as witnesses at trial and they shared their experiences. They shared why reaping the educational benefits of diversity is so important. We had basically class in court. We put students on the stand and had to explain things like, you know, the Black uh, Students Association has a guide for students coming in um, to help them navigate life in the university and in Cambridge, Massachusetts, as, you know, a person who might need to find a barber or a hairstylist who can competently do your hair. We talked about all sorts of things about the lived experience of students and alumni and how it really does matter. The Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law and Asian Americans Advancing Justice also put on four witnesses. So we had eight student and alumni witnesses testifying about the educational benefits of diversity and how the university's admissions process really is in keeping with the law. On the other side, there was not one witness who testified on behalf of students for fair admissions. And even though they analyzed 480 applicant files and data from 150,000 applicants. And even though they got to pick two thirds of those applicant files that they analyzed, they didn't identify even one applicant file that reflected a student who would have been admitted absent discrimination. So not only do you have kind of the erasure of all of the testimony, all of the evidence that we put in, but there's also the erasure of kind of the factual record from below and what actually happened. You don't see that coming through in the majority's opinion. And it's just interesting to see like the lack of loyalty to what the lower court findings were. Right. We we talk about that so often on this show, that this is what civil rights lawyers do. <laughs> they amass a record. The record is important. The district judge sets aside weeks for trial. And when that just kind of goes poof and is not part of any sort of judicial finding, then what is it that you're supposed to do for your job as a civil rights attorney if it doesn't matter? I do want to ask you about there's been some sort of ominous rumblings in the days since the opinion that the next thing to fall is DEI programs. The next thing to fall is any programs that take race into account. How seriously are you taking that or is that kind of catastrophizing? Does that follow logically from what we just read in these two opinions? Certainly not immediately. And I will say, you know, we're, we definitely take all of this seriously. All we do all day, every day is work to advance equal opportunity in this country. So obviously we take it very seriously. But I will say we have to go back to what was before the court in this opinion. This court was looking at the consideration of race as a tip in admissions in pursuit of the goal of the educational benefits of diversity. So we talked before about how this wasn't even about the use of race in all of higher education, right? Um, The court made very clear that the question of whether service academies can consider race and admissions was not before them. In addition to that, this clearly was not about the use of race for remedial purposes in higher education. Um, We don't know, you know, the, the court didn't say anything about private universities who aren't federally funded. So already it's not even about all of higher education. It's certainly not about employers. It wasn't about Title VII. It wasn't about corporate diversity, equity, and inclusion. It was not about contracting. It wasn't about critical race theory or ESG or affinity groups or recruiting or outreach or any of these other things. This is not what this case was about at all. The court doesn't say anything about those things. But we do understand that Uh, what the court has said may embolden certain very extremist groups that are seeking to challenge any efforts to advance equal opportunity in this country. And we've already seen those legal challenges. We're already involved in some of those legal challenges. What I can say is that thankfully thus far, those challenges haven't been successful. But the danger is that they may lead to a chilling effect. And so it's really important for people to be very careful when 
uh, taking action as a result of this decision. You have to be very careful to understand what this decision affects and what it does not affect. And really understand that on the other side, many, many of these actors are bound by federal and state anti-discrimination laws to provide an equal opportunity to everyone. So it cannot be the case that you retreat from every effort to provide equal opportunity and in fact, start denying people equal opportunities. It cannot be the case that you retreat from every diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility tactic that you have, and in so doing, send a very clear message that now people are not welcome, because that would actually be in contravention of many federal and state anti-discrimination laws. You know, one thing that it's really important to think about is um, identifying known barriers to opportunity. So as I mentioned before, uh, colleges and universities are obligated to comply with federal and state anti-discrimination laws that require them to give an equal opportunity to all applicants to compete for admission. And unfortunately, we're well aware that there are some criteria that they're considering that not all students have an equal opportunity to um, obtain. Um, so I'll give an example. Many colleges privilege calculus. Only 50% of high schools offer calculus. Of the high schools that offer calculus, uh, research shows that Black and Latino students tend to be tracked out of those classes, out of college preparatory classes writ large. So we have this situation where only 9% of Black students graduating from high school have taken calculus. In comparison to 22% of their white peers, in comparison to 50% of their Asian American peers. That's low hanging fruit. We need to hold our colleges and universities accountable and support them in making sure that the indicia of merit that they're looking for isn't missing entire swaths of the population simply because people don't have access to certain things like calculus. Um, many rural communities don't have access to calculus. Um, and so it really is incumbent upon us to make sure that our college admissions processes aren't imbued with racial inequality because they're considering things that are having an adverse disparate impact on entire swaths of the population. I want to give you one last beat, Michelle. I feel like I could talk to you all day because I feel like you're kind of helping me level set, like how what what's really bad and what's new and what's people overreacting. And I think everything you're saying is helping me sort of reorient what to think about next. But I do want to give you this one last question that I'm sitting with, which is, you know, to the extent that last term was, you know, shocking because we got Dobbs and we got Bruin and we got EPA and we got Coach Kennedy, this term is shocking in a way that is almost a sort of shot across the bow at education. That it seems to me that if you kind of link together what we saw in the debt relief case and in the affirmative action cases, this just feels like it's kind of punching the future in the throat, <laughs> that it is really going after education in a way that is different. It feels different to me <laughs> because it's going after the the dream that uh, we've all been building together. And I, I guess I'm just asking you this question that I often ask people after a truly, truly harrowing week at the court, which is, Michelle, what gives you hope that in the face of a court that just seems to have kind of done a, a one-two punch at ideas we have about democracy and education and fairness and access, what gives you hope that our young people are going to kind of spring back from these two very very significant setbacks. My clients, my colleagues, all of the people, so many allies um, who are working so very hard to make sure that people continue to have an equal opportunity to get an education. Um, you know, one of the most inspiring things about my work on this case was seeing the way that one client uh, kind of reached out to us and 
asked us to represent them and it snowballed. And all, and, you know, all of a sudden we represented, you know, dozens of groups at Harvard who weren't necessarily in touch with each other beforehand, but created just this lovely kind of multiracial, multi-generational alliance, all in support of the idea that everybody should have an equal opportunity to get an education. And also seeing, you know, the work across coalitions. You know, we work a lot with Asian Americans Advancing Justice and um, Latino Justice and Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. And just seeing that work, seeing how people have come together all in support of the idea that we will continue to work to make sure that everyone has an equal opportunity to get an education. That's inspiring. And there are lots of wins along that journey. And even if the court is signaling that it's throwing its hands up in the air and it may be retreating um, from the idea of equality in this country, the rest of us aren't. Um, the court doesn't get to tell us that we don't get to work towards equal opportunity and racial equity. And that's what we'll be here doing. Michelle Turnage Young is senior counsel at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, where she litigates education cases. She represented 25 Harvard student and alumni organizations as amicus curiae in SFFA v. Harvard. She also received her law degree from Harvard Law School. Michelle, I cannot thank you enough for giving me a little tiny island of sanity on a really tough week. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. And that is a wrap for this episode of Amicus. And while this is the episode at the end of the term, it is categorically not the last episode of Amicus, where we will be combing through the decisions and the fallout from the Supreme Court these past few weeks. Make sure you join us next Saturday for our annual star-studded breakfast table episode with leading lights and the super sharp minds you've come to expect, including the one and only Sherilyn Eiffel, Jamel Bowie of The New York Times, and our very own Mark Joseph Stern. We are going to try to process this last term and put it all in perspective. We have been able to bring all of our Opinion Palooza coverage to all of you thanks to the support of our Slate Plus members. All those emergency episodes, thanks to Slate Plus members. And so that bonus content has been outside the paywall for a little bit this June, but it's heading back behind our velvet rope soon. If you have grown dependent on all this extra amicus, please consider joining Slate Plus so you will never miss a beat. Go to slate.com slash amicus plus to sign up. Thank you so much. Thank you for sticking with us for this wild ride. And thank you so much for your letters, your questions, your comments. You can always keep in touch at amicus at slate.com. And you can always find us at facebook.com slash amicus podcast. Today's show was produced by Sarah Burningham. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio at Slate. And Ben Richmond is our senior director of operations. We will be back in a week with our breakfast table. We will probably sleep until then. But until we speak to you next, take good care. Want to lose weight, be less stressed, or manage a condition? Prescription for Wellness can improve your health with personalized sessions based on your schedule. Our expert health coaches and care managers use proven techniques. It's free for UPMC Health Plan members and could lead to the results you want. For more information, visit upmchp.us slash pfwellness. That's upmchp.us slash pfwellness. Holidays are here again, the Bargain King is your best friend. With deals so good, you're gonna win. Holidays are here again. We're celebrating Ollie Days, where the cheap gets cheaper. At Ollie's, we're celebrating our once-a-year customer appreciation bargain bonanza, where everything in our store is 15% off. And we mean everything. Ollie Days absolutely ends Sunday, July 2nd. Ollie's! Good stuff, cheap!